Platformer games have an insane skill cap. Rick Fernello has 202 percented all of Celeste completely deathless. Enox has done the entirety of The End Is Nigh in two runs, Nevermore and the carts included, and many other achievements have been done by the platforming community. Splunky 2, while I don't think the biggest achievements from that game can top those two, I would say has the hardest base game ending to any platformer ever. Splunky 2 is a 2D platformer roguelike, which means every level is procedurally generated where you have to get from the top of the level to the bottom. Each stage is filled with enemies to fend off, traps to be wary of, and of course, the all-knowing shopkeepers. The ending to this game revolves around a single run, where you can't die once and you have to pass a gauntlet of 94 levels, which can throw some of the most difficult and sometimes unfair challenges your way. This is Spelunky 2's hardest challenge, the Cosmic Ocean, and today, I'm going to show you how to beat it. <laughs> First of all, let's go over some important information about the game. The game is $20 usually, and half off whenever it goes on sale for $10. You play as Anna Spelunky, daughter of Guy Spelunky and Tina Flam. I'm not sure why it's not Tina Spelunky, but sure. You have a few main actions, walking, jumping, whipping, grabbing, and throwing. You can also place bombs and ropes, which allows access to areas you wouldn't have been able to normally reach otherwise. Whipping is the single most important thing in the entire game, so I'll teach you how it works and how it can be used to your advantage rather than your downfall. On frame 1 of you pressing the whip button, a pretty huge hitbox comes out of your back for 9 frames, and then another one comes out of your front for another 9 frames. It's essential to learn back whipping enemies as soon as possible, because it is single-handedly the most important tech in the entire game in my opinion. The other forms of actions are all fairly simple, and they don't really need much of an explanation. If you haven't played the game much yet, what you're going to want to do first is reach Volcano, the second stage of the game after the dwellings, and whip this coffin open whenever you find it. This is going to be your character from now on, as Life's Project is the best character ever. I'm just kidding, you can use whatever you want. There's no differences between any character, but Lice is in my opinion the both cutest and most fun character to play as. Hell, I even have a plushie of her. She's just that awesome. Yes. You're fucking head away from my head before I fuck you up the under repair. What the fuck? I'll let you experience and learn all of the rest of the game though. This video is mainly just how to do Cosmic Ocean, which I'm gonna abbreviate to CO. Before I get into that though, I'm gonna talk about the route and the items that you should be bringing there for the highest chances of winning. First, let's talk about the route. The route is gonna be pretty simple. Get the Ujedi and Dwellings. Ideally, you wanna kill Quillback for extra bombs and a health point. Then get Van Horsing in 2 1 of Volcano. Go down to Vlad's Castle and obtain Vlad's Cape. The cape allows you to double jump and hover down while holding space. You'll need to grab who used bow from Toon, and you really don't wanna forget it. For Olmec, bomb down to Waddler and put the bow in there. From here, you wanna do Olmec's skip. In total, with bombing down to Waddler, it requires 5 bombs, so as long as you kill Quillback and don't use more than 2 bombs, you'll be just fine. From there, go down to Temple, on the 3rd layer of Olmec. Find this chunk in 4-1 and get the Alien Compass from Van Horsing, as it shows you the exit in CO. Next, you're going to want to kill Anubis and grab his scepter, then in the next stage, you're going to want to do the Star Challenge for the Elixir and then go to the City of Gold. The City of Gold has a guaranteed Kali Altar, which you want to sacrifice the Hired Hand and the Pet on this stage. You'll get 14 out of the 16 required Kali Favor Points for Kapala, which ideally you'd have one by now from another Altar in a different stage, but even now it's still nice to be getting extra favor. Do not go to Duat, it is not worth it. In Ice Caves, you do not need to go to the Mothership, but you should be killing both the Yeti King and Queen for ropes and spike shoes. And for Neobab, just don't die. At Tiamat, perform a skip with climbing gloves and spring shoes if you have them. Watch Gugubo's video on how to do it if you don't have either one of them. Now, in Sunken City, do the Sun Challenge and then get the bow and arrow. Take it to Hundun, kill Hundun, and then shoot that mofo's eyes right open. You're now in the Cosmic Ocean. As for the items that you should have, spike shoes are guaranteed and a very nice utility for CO. Other good items are climbing gloves if you're rocking Vlad's cape, and spring shoes are always super nice to have. Spectacles are good for some stages, as you won't get blinded by enemies like Octopi, and parachutes are pretty useful, just try not to accidentally use them and die because of it. Pitcher's Mitt is very good, but I would only recommend taking it after Olmec, because I don't really like Olmec while using Pitcher's Mitt. 
Paste is just a creme de la crop for CO. Bombs are extremely useful, and being able to bomb anything as long as you're able to throw a bomb at it is extremely reassuring and helpful. The Kapala is a must-have. It's the only real way to heal, and you really don't want to die from getting hit by enemies during CO. The Elixir is also super helpful, allowing you to get twice as much health from healing. Those are all the passive items, and the only good holding item I would recommend is the Boomerang. The Boomerang can be acquired from Tiki Men during CO, so you won't have to worry about taking it with you. Finally though, let's start actually talking about the main part of the video, the Cosmic Ocean. Cosmic Ocean is a gauntlet of 94 levels, consisting of random chunks different from the ones found in the previous areas. Each stage has exactly three bubbles that must be popped, and once all of them are popped, the Cosmic Jellyfish at the exit of the stage will wake up and start to chase you. That jellyfish is an instant kill upon touching it, so you'll need to be getting out as fast as possible, especially considering that after 3 minutes, another jellyfish spawns and begins to chase you, similar to how the ghost works. Each level is similar to Mario 64 in the case of having parallel universes. The level loops horizontally and also vertically. You always want to be using this to your advantage, but be very careful about using the horizontal loop. Anything that falls in there will continue falling until either interrupted or broken, such as a rock or skull getting hit. I've been killed multiple times by something falling through the loop and stunning me as the jellyfish kills me, so you really do not want to be getting caught in that. There's 8 types of stages that you can get, which are the same as the areas earlier in the game. Dwellings, Jungle, Volcana, Tide Pool, Temple, Ice Caves, Neo Babylon, or Neobab, and Sunken City. I'll go through each of them from the easiest to hardest in my opinion, as all of them have a different playstyle you need to adapt to to win. Let's start with Ice Caves. Ice caves, while being the easiest area, are still nothing to scoff at. At the start of the stage, usually you'll hear some explosions from either yetis walking into landmines or UFOs just deciding to eject and blow up. It's best to stay underneath something for a couple seconds, around 10 to 20 at most. Usually though, it can be a cakewalk. Landmines can be useful every now and then for getting rid of spikes or yetis, and the trampoline thing it can be lethal if you just don't see it. Ice caves are really not that bad though, so let's step it up a little bit and go to dwellings. Dwellings are cramped and can force you into some pretty bad winding paths. You'll always want to be carrying around a corpse from either a caveman or a mole, because if you get caught off guard by an arrow trap, they will take the hit for you. Spikes are everywhere here, so you'll need to be very aware of every single one of them. For dwellings, it's usually best if you start at the top and go systematically through to find every bubble. Especially for dwellings, you'll want to make a path of bombs from the last bubble for the exit. Stepping it up again, we have the sunken city, which is also really not that hard. All three of the previous areas are about tied for me in terms of difficulty, so yeah. You don't have any corpse to carry here, so the poison arrow traps must be seen and deactivated as soon and safely as possible. Water can actually be a bit of an issue here, and it can get in the way of some places, and not usually a fun thing to have to get through whenever the jellyfish is chasing you. Orange frogs are something to look out for, because they will explode upon death. You'll need to position them in a good spot if you don't want them to get like water everywhere. Regeneration blocks are also a pretty big issue sometimes. You really don't want to get caught inside of them because 90% of the time you will probably die unless you're spamming your whip. Those are, in my opinion, the three easy layouts, so let's step it up a bit and get to some of the harder ones. Let's start with Volcana. Usually this is a more of an open kind of stage, but that can really be to your detriment sometimes. Because it's a fucking volcano, lava is everywhere, and of course, it's very easy for it to get out of its confinement. Robots can destroy the blocks surrounding them very easily, so you'll need to be careful of where they are and what they could do if you were to step on them. Thankfully, lava mandos don't spawn, but imps and falling platforms are very dangerous. If there's nothing between you and the imp, it will drop its cauldron and it can easily kill you if you're not careful and you don't see it. Falling platforms, likewise, can also easily kill you if you don't see them. If you ever activate a falling platform, make sure beforehand to see if it will fall and destroy itself on the ground below it. If it doesn't and it lands on your head, it will instantly kill you, possibly destroying your backpack item as well. There's one more extremely dangerous part of Volcana that I haven't mentioned yet, and that would be the ball and chain. You should never be moving upwards in Volcana unless you know there's not a ball and chain above anywhere you're moving. They can and will crush you, destroying your back item and getting rid of your Ankh if you still have it. I've died on 768 because of it once, and it was not my favorite way to go out. Let's cool down all the lava though, and go to a more cool place like Tide Pool. Tide Pool is actually not that bad of an area, but it can be pretty exhausting to go through sometimes. The water can easily go everywhere if you're not careful, and Jiangxi Assassins will just come out of literally nowhere and just knock you into the spikes because of course they would. 
Hermit crabs can get you poisoned easily if you're not careful of how you deal with them, and Pangshis just suck. Sometimes the route to the exit can get pretty tight, and yeah. Tide pool is just much more of a be on your toes kind of area. It can be dealt with pretty easily though if you do everything carefully. The next and final three layouts though are easily the things that you need to be watching out for literally every single thing whenever you're in one of them. Let's start with the easiest one in my opinion, jungle. Jungle is the most cramped area in the game, dwellings and tide pool don't compare. And it has some of the most dangerous enemies in the entire game. Monkeys can be annoying if they latch onto you, because they can either stun you, take some of your gold, take your back on and off, or throw a bomb. And thankfully a single rope will get it off your back, so gotta have ropes. Big spiders don't spawn here, but other huge hazards like tiki men and witch doctors do. Tiki men are pretty easy to deal with most of the time, as long as you're not in their line of sight, you'll be just fine. They can, however, infinite you, ending the run on the spot. Witch doctors are brutal, however. They can see you from pretty far away, and if they do see you, they'll stab the voodoo doll and send you flying. Oh my fucking god. What the fuck? Excuse me? Holy shit. This attack can be negated if you jump into a thorn or any sort of invincibility frames during the attack's connection frames. Witch Doctors do, however, have this little fucking skull that flies towards you, and if it touches you, you're cursed. These make Witch Doctors extremely lethal, as being anywhere near them can get you fucked up really quickly. Thankfully though, it's not an insta-kill, and you're able to continue the run until you die. Wanna know an enemy that doesn't let you continue? Man Traps. Man Traps will literally just kill you if you touch them. Back item and everything. You can't jump on their head, they don't take damage from thorns, and they're absolutely lethal here. You'd want to be in a, about a 2-3 to three block radius from one of them at all times, because they're just terrifying and they will get you at the smallest slip up. That's pretty much it for the jungle however, so let's move on to something even more deadly. Neo Babylon, or Neo Bab as I'm going to call it, is very hard. Lava just shows up everywhere here, and it can easily get flung into the loop if the high amount of explosives just... Oh my god. One trillion dollars? Mechs aren't here, but the UFOs are as deadly as ever, because now you can just be standing near them, and now you're at risk of it hitting you. Because of these things. Spark traps are very dangerous. They can just appear at some points, and if it hits you, there's a good chance that it could just straight up be the end of the run. Elevators are also a pretty big threat. They s just simply show up and they'll just fucking kill you, like really quickly. Walking on top of the stage is not a very good option because of them. Which, by the way, this exit right here, you always want to bomb it. That exit can just straight up have the worst timing ever whenever you're running from the jellyfish, and... I don't know where it is! Okay. Go! You'll just die if it doesn't feel like letting you through. Newbab is just really a chaotic place, so it's hard to give advice that isn't just get used to it or have a lot of practice. It's always nice leaving a Neobab level though, because most of the time, you'll have a little bit of time before the harder stages kick in. Other times, however, you spawn into a temple layout. Temple is without a doubt the hardest layout. Every single enemy and every single trap here is extremely dangerous, no matter what build or strategies you may have. Enemies like the Cobra are harmless at first, but then they start to spit poison, and sometimes it's just a super random spot from the other side of the map, looping over to right where you're standing. A positive with Temple, before we get to the really bad stuff, are mummies. Mummies are quite literally an infinite blood source, paired with a Kapala, and you have 99 health. That health, however, can be useless though, because sometimes the little mummy kitty just wants to play and boom, you're cursed. Mummy cats, or cursed cats as I call them, need to be treated with care. Throwing something at them from afar will just kill them easily, but if you're in any kind of close distance to them, you need to get the fuck away from them as fast as possible, and ideally you can get rid of them safely. Necromancers and sorceresses are also pretty big problems sometimes. They can spawn a lot of enemies and even insurrect some of them sometimes. Nothing compares, however, to the Crocmen. Crocmen are awful. They teleport around if you try to hit them, and they're one of the fastest moving enemies in the game with erratic movement. And they fling you around if you get hit by them. They're only considered dead if they're crushed by a trap or teleport into a wall, or if you magically kill them through whipping. You can also put two paste bombs on them, but even then that's still kind of hard to do. Also, don't forget about one of the main things about the temple that everybody hates. The Crush Trap. 
Crush traps really suck sometimes. First and foremost, there is a spawn in Temple where there's just a giant crush trap right above you, which is why at the start of every stage, I would recommend to pause and just immediately recognize everything around you, because not just Temple spawns can suck, but Temple is another kind of you just you need experience kind of thing. Simply knowing what can and will happen is not enough. You need to experience Temple and CO because it is very much different from watching a video or learning how it works. That's everything related to the actual stage layouts, so let's start talking about actual strategy when it comes to popping the bubbles and making it to the exit. There's a few main ways to actually pop the bubbles, and sometimes it can be really hard to do. First of all, since there's always exactly three bubbles in every stage, you'll need to keep count of how many bubbles have been popped. Notice how I didn't say how many bubbles you popped, because stage hazards and enemies can also pop them. Most specifically, explosions from UFOs and elevators in ice caves or Neobab respectively will always pop them. Not always, but usually very often. Sometimes one of them pops right as you load into the stage, which you can hear. Speaking of hearing, you actually don't need to count them one by one. You're able to tell how many have been popped based on the sound it makes along with the particles that come out of it. In order, 1, 2, and 3 all sound like this, and create roughly this amount of particles on average. Pairing them together will always allow you to keep track of the bubbles. But now, let's get into the strategy of actually popping them. I like to check around the edge of the stage first, and then go systematically by layer. Because Spelunky runs off of a chunk system, there's always going to be X amount of layers in a stage. I'm not exactly sure what the limit for a CO stage is, but from the amount of runs I've done, I would probably say anywhere from 6x6 to 8x8, with both numbers being independent from one another. Systematically, the correct way to do it is to start at one of the top corners and go from side to side on each layer until you find all three of them. Ideally, you want the jellyfish to be chasing you for as little time as possible. Usually you want to pop the closest one to the exit last, and the other two in either order. Making paths with bombs or something like a matic is a very good idea. It can reduce the amount of corners you might have to turn to avoid the jelly. Say you accidentally pop the closest two to the exit, and then you have to pop one from a very bad part of the map like the center. You must learn how to kite the jellyfish, as that is absolutely the single most important part of CO in my opinion. It has two states, the dormant and attacking states. Dormant is when you haven't popped all three bubbles yet, and it sits atop the exit door, waiting for you to either die or pop the bubbles. Popping the bubbles sets the state into attack. Attack phase is pretty simple. It draws the most efficient line to you and will start dashing towards you. Every dash has about a 1 to 2 second delay, and during the dash is the only time it's able to curve its trajectory. However, it's not always a perfect straight line that it takes to you, because that would be pretty unfair. Its curves are sharp, but they do still follow an arc-like movement, and sometimes they can't turn far enough to hit you. Some scenarios can end up like this, where you're in the middle of the jelly circling around you, which will happen indefinitely, until you move again or die from another cause. This is actually a major help, as if you need to take a sharp turn into any direction and the jelly is just close enough to where you would die if you were to, you can simply kite it into this position and then you'll be well on your way with a decent bit of timing. Cutting the jellyfish can be tough in some situations. Tighter spots like the ones in jungle or dwellings are good examples of that. Knowing that it can only turn whenever it's in its dash phase is crucial. It's kind of one of the things that is just getting more used to it. Only the big head of the jellyfish has a hitbox, everything else is just simply decorative. The hitbox is... well... <gasps> oh my god. <laughs> oh my fucking god! questionable at best. If it does hit you, however, it is of course an insta-kill. This does remove your back item, so if you die from it and you need to retrieve your pack or cape, you will need to route your way back over there and get it before you exit the stage. Cutting the jelly without any mobility items like a cape or pack is pretty tough, but it's still doable. Check out some of Ivyoary's speedruns for some good examples of cutting the jelly, as well as some other good tips you may pick up along the way. Taking notes seems kinda goofy for games in my opinion, but if you're really going for a Cosmic Ocean completion, I would seriously recommend it. I would also recommend keeping a log of every time you reach CO and where you die, noting how the run went and any mistakes that you may have had. Writing them down will help you recall them in situations that are pretty similar and possibly end up saving the run. Alright, now spoilers for the end incoming, unless you already know what it is. Once you reach 799, you are spinning in the middle of space and become one with the stars, a constellation. Seeing this screen alone is one of the best feelings ever, but I can give you some tips on how to make it even better. This is the list of every constellation prefix and suffix you can get, and each of them have a different effect on its appearance. 
The easiest one, in my opinion, to get, that's not Felix or Minor, is Anemus. Anemus requires you to have above 50 health, and another star gets added for each health point above 50 that you have. Fidelis and Major are the next two easiest, as Fidelis is having more than 24 Kali favor points, which is pretty easy to do given you have enough altars throughout the run. Fidelis adds one bright red star to the constellation for every 8 points that you have above 24. Major is simply having over a million dollars, which I got accidentally in my run. It adds a bright yellow star for each million that you have. A more challenging one, though, is Celeritas, which requires you to finish the run in under an hour and 56 minutes. It makes all the stars more spread out, which can look pretty snazzy on some constellations. If you really want a challenge, though, you want to go for the hardest constellation to get, Solanum Asinus. Solanum Asinus is achieved by having the Eggplant Crown and the True Crown upon exiting the run. Definitely the hardest challenge for a constellation in my opinion. If you want it to be a nice color, it's customizable. The color of the lines connecting each star is determined by the color of your character. The color choice is up to you. The color is also visible in the top left of any part of the run, as your heart's color will also be what color the constellation is. But that's about everything for the constellation, and with that, the end of the guide. Thank you for watching this guide, even if it was pretty rambly at some points. Splunky 2 is one of my favorite games ever, and it has the difficulty I love and just it's fun overall. If you don't have the game yet and are interested in platformers or just looking for a really good challenge, I would highly recommend this game. Sometimes it can be pretty unfair, and other times it can be one of the most rewarding moments of your gaming career. Thank you again for watching, and until next time, see ya. Finally, I'm done editing this video. That took me so fucking long, dude. <sighs> okay, now I can go get to uploading. No, no, I've had it with you. You see now, right there? Right there? I fucking had it with you.